from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Glenn Tonzer with this week's cattle market segment. He'll comment on the continued good news on the beef demand front, and he'll talk about the significant improvements in the projections on feedlot cattle returns heading into 2018. Then Kansas FFA state reporter Riley Schlichter provides a wrap-up of the 2017 National FFA Convention. Also, K-State student Malia Anderson will preview the next in the Dan Upson Lecture Series coming up a week from today. It'll feature Dr. Leon Berenger, a veterinarian with the U.S. Air Force. And for this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Beth Hinshaw offers guidelines on selecting projects for this new 4-H year. All that right here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Cattle markets front and center, first off right here, and Glenn Tonzer is across the way once more. Livestock economist with K-State Research and Extension and with a positive beat to this market as we talk of the trades this past week, really right across the board we see higher prices, Glenn. Yeah, the general tone would be it was an up week. Dig into the details and I'll give us some numbers in a moment, but we actually had the markets pulled down early in the week. I would say partly in response to a slightly bearish cattle and feed report, which was broke down before. Mm -hmm. But the encouraging thing would be is we ended the week higher, so the tone got stronger throughout the week. And as I've been doing for probably six weeks now, I keep attributing that to a strong demand signal. So let's turn to the numbers, and hopefully mm-hmm. that'll you know, speak to itself. But the cash market, fed cattle was just over 110 on pretty light trade, less than 500 head of steers live on Friday. So the five market average is 110. Uh, there's lots of discussion about feedlots holding out for higher prices. And part of that's because there is a strong signal on the board. So when you look at the December live cattle contract, it traded the ended Friday at almost 121, up four bucks for the week. So that's part of why when uh, those feedlot operators are looking ahead, they're asking for higher prices. Of course, they're always asking for higher prices, mm-hmm. but the signal from the December contract is maybe they'll get it. When we go back to feeder cattle, uh, November feeder cattle contract was up three bucks for the week, about 156 and a half. Continues a fairly long run of the October and now the November feeder cattle contract rallying. And that's positioned cow-calf producers to have a good sale price, uh, most of which have incurred it by now, but you've still got November calves to sell. That's set up very well this year. Feeder cattle cash market was very mixed around the country. And much like I said earlier, if the auction was earlier in the week, it was down or flat. If it was later in the week, it was up. One specific one would be is Dodge City uh, was actually scored by EMS as being flat to 10 bucks up compared to the prior week. Two small lots to compare, 52 head of 538 pounders sold at 184 and there was no note about value added or anything like that. That's a pretty strong, healthy price for calves, mm-hmm. given what we expected. And then a lot of 211 head, 650 pounders at 167. So those could just be heavier calves as well. There's a lot of cow-calf producers who had not you know, protected against downside or gave away upside price protection that may well have made over $100 this year. And we would not have expected that, you know, ask me three months ago, ask me six months ago, ask me 12 months ago, knowing we were expanding the herd, I would not have projected that. So it's turned out to be a much better 2017 for many cow-calf producers than we thought it'd be. Yeah, quite a nice bounce back on the feeder cattle auction side from the previous week where it was a sharply lower overtone there. Yes, it was. And part of that's a little bit of a weather snapback. And part of it would be also, and I'll get through this in a moment, but those demand signals are coming from many ways. When you look at the cutout value this mm-hmm. past week, Choice cutout was up three and a half bucks. We're back above two hundred, so choice cutout is two oh three. Select cutout is one ninety two. It was up about a buck and a half for the week. And again, as everybody understands, if you have those choice cutouts come up, that allows us to pay more for feeder cattle, which in turn allows us to give more staying power and higher prices of those feeder cattle. Related to that, and I'll, I'll just encourage people to go to Ag Manager for the details, but uh, 10 days ago, I, actually 15 days ago, I updated the feedlot returns, and they have improved a lot over the last couple months. I'm not going to belabor it, other than I'm just going to say that when you account for the fact that the live cattle market's up about 2 bucks since I put those out, 
the rest of 2017 and early 2018, we're actually projecting positive closeouts. And again, I was not saying that two months ago, right. much less six months ago. And that is an attribute to Fed cattle prices are higher than we thought. And that, again, gives staying power to the ability and the willingness to pay more for feeder cattle. So it all circles back to wholesale beef, fed cattle, live cattle, feeder cattle are all higher than we thought they'd be. And that's at a time when supplies are up. That only happens when you have strong demand. I know I sound like a broken record, but it's very, very important we understand that. And you note you've your latest feedlot returns, your projections on agmanager.info. Those are in such stark contrast to what we were talking about a few months ago. So producers ought to go take a look at that. And it changes the game, really. It, it changes the game. And I, I don't want to encourage anybody to be lax on risk management. If anything, I encourage them to say, is it a time to lock something in? And we have tools on Ag Manager to do that. The feeder cattle risk management tool is something you can use there or email me and I can help you find it, but it does give the opportunity to potentially lock in a positive margin, which that opportunity did not exist certainly 60 days ago or six months ago. And that's a much more friendly discussion for yours truly to be running around the state (laughs) talking about. So it's more enjoyable for sure. You bet. You do have an update on the cold storage numbers that uh, as of September the 30th, add to this picture of, well, friendly information. Yeah. And it gives another snapshot on, you know, basically where demand fits in this is what I'm trying to get across. But cold storage in aggregate has been going up year over year for some time, but that's because we've increased beef production. So at any one point in time, if you got more beef in the supply chain, it might land in cold storage for a while. The concern is whether it parks there for too long and we're stacking up meat and we can't find a home for it. That's why people look at this report. So it's a nice report that doesn't get talked about enough. What I want to highlight here is cold storage stocks as a percentage of what we're producing. So if you're pulling down that statistic, that means we're pushing beef through the system relative to what we produce. That only happens if you have very good marketing of beef and some strong demand signals, and we've had that for at least the last six months. So as a percentage of our production, cold storage stocks are actually coming down. So some people will talk about there's a lot of meat in the freezer, and that's okay to talk about, but it's easy to lose sight of context. When you have a growing meat industry, you're going to have larger stocks in many cases month over month, but if you back up and put it relative to the size that we're producing, we're actually pulling down those stocks. I highlight that because that's only happening with strong demand, and I think that's both domestic and and foreign. In past segments, I've talked a lot about export demand being a big part of the 2017 story. You only get this cold storage positive news if there is a strong demand pull given the supply growth we've had. So there's lots of ways to make this point that demand is raising the boat for everybody in the industry. And hopefully I'm effectively making that clear. Before we leave the topic of demand, though, We are heading into the holidays where poultry and pork tend to take over, at least uh, for the seasonal uh, demands that are out there. And one wonders if beef demand will cool off, if nothing else, because of those uh, seasonal routines that we see. Yeah, and that's it's always a good question. This is a Tonger opinion, is the cross-price effect of pork and poultry, I personally think, is mitigating some over time. Um, Myself, Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Lusk are working with the Beef Board to try to confirm that suspicion if you like. But I only note that because if, in fact, it is weakening, then we could be less concerned about that. Time will tell, right? We need to do the research to back that up. But I think some of that is occurring because we have busier households that don't take the same time to switch meal plans like they once did. Therefore, cross prices aren't quite as strong. But it does, you know, your point's well taken. We need to monitor that. Mm -hmm. I will also note, however, there's discussion in the industry about now that we have larger beef supplies compared to, say, three years ago, Beef is actually available to be a featured item as well. So that in itself doesn't mean demand's going to go up. It depends on how much we got to cut price in that story. But the fact that beef is available to be part of a retailer's featuring you know, plan is a nice thing. Mm-hmm. In the past, you've had only pork and poultry available, where in some sense the retailer's hands were tied because there wasn't enough beef around to be part of the featuring. Now with supplies up, if they choose to, that could be part of that. So how all that shakes out over the next three or four months is to be determined, of course. But I'm optimistic that the current demand signals for beef are strong. They will carry us through. I think you'll see a little bit more featuring of beef just because the demand of it's strong, and maybe those retailers won't have to give as much of a price break to get the benefit they want out of featuring and yet there's pounds available. And moreover, the export demand story remains strong. Mm-hmm. So we may not be as concerned about domestic trade-offs that are embedded in that pork poultry price effect as maybe we have been in the past when export demand was weaker. A uh, great foundation under the markets now in the form of beef demand. And uh, for the here and now, it's tremendous news for the cattle sector. We do want to finish off with your latest comments and analysis on uh, how to consider 
those fall calves in regard to marketing, retaining ownership, what works, what doesn't, and you've thrown some new numbers at that, Glenn. Yeah, and the, the story is very similar, but this is the time of year, like I give weekly updates on this just to see if it's changed, is if somebody's either already sold a November calf or is you know contemplating it, I encourage them to use beefbasis.com to basically assess what's the value of gain of putting additional pounds on. And two specific examples would be, what about retaining as well January? So maybe deferring a sale of a 550-pound calf make it a 725 pound or almost a yearling say in January the value of gain in the slant of markets at the moment is projected at 109 almost everybody with an average cost production would be let's say 60 70 cents so there's a pretty positive healthy margin there if interested in it you know of course there's lots of risk behind this the other one would be maybe go further out go all the way to next March maybe sell a yearling weigh 750 pounds then so this would be a slower growth exercise maybe leverage and wheat in a different way in this story uh, value gain there about ninety nine dollars per hundred weight that again is quite a bit above historic margins so if you had say sixty five dollar cost of gain that would be attractive for somebody I again encourage people to compare their own cost of gain to that their own equity position and tolerance for risk because just because today's margins look good doesn't mean the hold there. But I'm mainly highlighting that because it's yet another point. Those deferred prices are expected to be high enough that somebody's going to engage in those enterprises I'm talking about, and that gives staying power here, I think, in November to these future cattle prices. And to walk through your options there, that risk management tool on the agmanager.info website, immensely helpful. Yes, and for those that are interested in saying how would the use of futures or options or the USD LRP contract help mitigate some of that price risk, you can't use those tools for free, but it helps map that out. That tool that you just mentioned, Eric, is on agmanager.info. And what you're looking for there by title, the K-State Feeder cattle risk management tool. Do check that out and utilize it, agmanager.info. Glenn, it's a positive story for the markets right now. Hopefully it'll continue this week. Yep, I hope so too. Appreciate you coming over. Thank you. He is Glenn Tonzer, a livestock economist with K-State Research and Extension, offering up his take on the cattle markets this week. We'll stand aside now. When we return, a final recap of the goings-on at the 90th National FFA Convention, which concluded over the weekend in Indianapolis, with our next guest here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. We're back now on this Agriculture Today. As promised, we have a full recap now of the latter part of the 2017 National FFA Convention. It concluded this past Saturday in Indianapolis. And with us in studio now is the individual who's been kind enough to report back from convention with us. He's in Manhattan once more and back to the Scholastics here at K-State. Riley Schlichter is the state FFA reporter. He is originally from the Abilene FFA chapter. Riley, you're probably uh, pretty much spent after Indianapolis, but uh, it had to be a wonderful experience. Oh, it was a certainly incredible experience, uh, especially since I had the opportunity to represent the Kansas FFA Association as a voting delegate. So it it was an entirely new experience for me. And we want to, in a few moments, get into some of the business that was conducted by the delegates while at convention. But we do want to highlight those who achieved well in the latter part of the convention with awards handed out Friday and Saturday. And you have quite a list of those who racked up great accomplishments. That is correct. And on the Friday, we once again had a marvelous day for the Kansas Association. If we remember back to Austin Nordyke, He, again, was on stage, and this time he was awarded the National Proficiency Award winner for the area of turf grass management. And if you remember, as we talked uh, last week, Austin was also named our national star in agribusiness. We also had the Washington County FFA chapter. They were awarded the top chapter in the veterinary science CDE. Skylar Zinger from the Washington County FFA chapter was named the high individual overall in the veterinary science career development event. 
move on to the Lewisburg FFA chapter, and Lewisburg was named the national champions in the Food Science and Technology Career Development event. The Spring Hill FFA chapter was named the third overall FFA chapter in the Poultry Evaluation Career Development event. The Inman chapter was named fifth overall in the Horse Evaluation Career Development event with Ali Leslie of the Inman FFA chapter being named the high individual in that event. The Prairie View Agricultural Sales chapter was named sixth overall in that career development event. And then the Rock Creek chapter was named sixth overall in the Livestock Evaluation Career Development event as well. So congratulations to all of those young people for those achievements, for there to be well acknowledged for those to be sure. Kansas FFA did have a national officer nominee, a candidate in the mix who did make the finals. Kyler Langvart from the Chapman chapter, regrettably, he did not make that final six. But just being a finalist is an enormous achievement, is it not, Riley? That is correct. Kyler um, had the opportunity to represent the Kansas FFA Association, and we are extremely proud for uh, Kyler, and we're extremely proud to call him a Kansas FFA member. He represented our association extremely well during the process and over the past uh, six, seven years of his FFA career. Indeed. You did have the business of the convention to take care of as delegates, and we've been talking about that in the reports you've been filing from the convention floor, Riley, some of the things that were being considered, and you noted that there were a number of committee proposals that were brought to the floor. Of those, did several of them move on to passage, or or what was the fate of those? Yes, sir. We ended up bringing six delegate committee proposals to the floor, and those six proposals were all passed by the delegate members and by the entire voting body. So now the fate of those six committee proposals is they will be passed on to the National FFA Board. And the National FFA Board will take the next year and review each of those whereas and resolution statements. Um, This can be a year-long process. I had the opportunity to talk to the Kansas State FFA advisor, uh, Mr. Kurt Dillon, and he has the opportunity to sit on that board. And so he he gave us a little insight on how that process works. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see how some of those suggestions and recommendations that we as delegates passed see what the fate is for them. Of those six, which ones stand out to you in terms of importance to the future of the FFA? I think there's one or two major ones. One of the big ones that I mentioned last week was the delegate allocation. And the delegate allocation has been a recent uh, discussion topic uh, over the past two, three years. This year, the delegate committee uh, that was on that topic decided that for now, Uh, we are going to stay kind of in the same area with the 475 delegates total, or the delegates will be allotted out based on the population of FFA members in each state. I believe that here in the next two, three years, that again is going to be brought up as some of the smaller states are asking for some more some more influence by having an equal amount of delegates. But for here and now, it's status quo as far as For here and now, it's status quo. I I foresee it being um, a challenge in the future. And then the other major one um, that I actually had the opportunity to sit on was the inclusion of the unpaid SAE. One of the major uh, controversial issues right now is that for those FFA members who have an unpaid SAE, they are not allowed to receive their American FFA degree. And the reason this is, is because in the American FFA degree requirements, you must make a minimum of $2,000 and a certain number of hours, or $10,000 total. Right now, since these unpaid SAEs are not able to meet that requirement, we are at a point where we believe it is time to make a change and allow for more members to have the opportunity to receive their American FFA degree. And our committee heavily discussed this. We had many um, views going both ways. As of now, uh, we passed a committee report saying that we will further evaluate the inclusion of unpaid SAEs in the American FFA degree, basically leaving it up to the uh, National FFA Board to uh, once again reevaluate that and hopefully here in the future be able to include unpaid SAEs. So again, that will be contemplated by the board in the coming year. That is correct. Well, well, as the other business. Well, Riley, having served as a delegate, as an attendee, 
your impressions of the state of the FFA, to put it that way, as you've observed what went on at convention and uh, how these activities might have impacted your outlook on the FFA. Any thoughts? Uh, This was my first national convention where I had the opportunity to become extremely involved. Um, This was actually the fourth convention that I've attended, but this one, it definitely stood out for me. I had the opportunity to be involved and represent the Kansas Association. It really broadened my outlook as during all of our delegate committee work, I had the opportunity to really meet and get to know a group of individuals from across the United States. One of the most unique experiences that I had was everywhere I went for that delegate committee process, I could turn and I would be able to see a new person or somebody who I was vaguely familiar with, and they were representing every state. We had somebody there from every state, every part of the entire National FA organization of the United States. So it was a really unique experience opportunity to to feel that representation of the entire United States all coming together and being able to to discuss some of the uh, major topics um, within the National FFA organization. It's a rewarding experience. There's no doubt about that. And, and FFA is on extraordinarily good footing right now, nationally, certainly here in the state of Kansas, right? That is correct. This past year at National Convention, we had a record-breaking year. At the last session, we had just over 67,000 FFA members registered. And at the rate that we're growing, we might have to start looking for a a new home rather than Indianapolis as we're starting to fill up Bankers Live Fieldhouse (laughs) with all of our attendees. That's a great story to tell and to hear about. Lastly, what's next for the state FFA officer team? Busy time at convention, but your pace continues briskly, does it not, throughout the rest of the scholastic year? That is true. We just wrapped up a convention, and here in November and December, it won't slow down a whole lot. Myself and the rest of the officers will travel uh, the majority of Kansas on uh, many chapter visits and uh, small leadership experiences. One key uh, activity that I can think of here in the near future is over Thanksgiving break. Uh, Myself and my five other officers will be traveling out to southwest Kansas to Hugoton. At Hugo 10, we will be helping put on a uh, small uh, leadership development camp where it will be a a whole day. And then after that day experience, uh, we'll spend the rest of the next uh, two, three days out there in southwest Kansas touring some of the sponsors and just go on some industry visits with our uh, foundation director, Ms. Beth Gaines. That's a small sampling of what you have ahead in the months to come. Correct. Um, one major thing that uh, myself and our other officers are looking forward to is in January, um, the International Leadership Seminar for State Officers. Um, this event is where we have the opportunity to travel to South Africa on a 16-day excursion where we'll be able to learn more about South African agriculture and um, how what we do here in the United States kind of compares to what goes on across seas. Wow. Another rich experience. We wish you and the rest of the officer team all the best in this year ahead. And Riley, thank you for taking the time to share your reflections on the National Convention with us the last several days. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Currently the Kansas FFA state reporter, and he is from the Abilene FFA chapter, Riley Schlichter. That's a quick look back at the National FFA Convention 2017. Once again, it came to a close over the weekend in Indianapolis. We'll be back with more after these few moments away. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. We're 
back now on this Agriculture Today. And a group of students here at Kansas State University has once again pooled its talents and thoughts into inviting the next speaker in the Dan Upson Lecture Series here at K-State, which addresses contemporary issues in food production. Joining us now is a junior in animal sciences and industry and agricultural economics here at K-State, Malia Anderson. She is chairing the Upson Lecture Series Committee this year. Malia, welcome to you, and we invite you to remind folks about this series. It is named after a long time and a very, very revered veterinarian here at K-State. Yeah, so this series is named after Dr. Dan Upson, who was a long-term academia here at vet school. So we're really, really excited to do this lecture in his honor. He was a really great individual. So yeah, this lecture stemmed from Food for Thought, which is an organization made up of undergrad, graduate students, as well as vet students and some young alumni. So a really diverse group of students that we really just want to keep the disconnect between public and agriculture as small as possible and try to present them with these lecture series based on science, based on facts, and just to try to keep open connection. With the public at large. Yeah. And uh, quite a few students are part of the Food for Thought initiative, aren't Mm -hmm. they, Yes. So we have a really strong committee that our main focus is um, this lecture series, and we have a lot of strong people that are backing us, that are helping us a lot. Now, Malia, to paint, if you will, the prestige that goes with this lecture series. You might go through the previous presenters. It's quite a list of uh, impressive folks. Yeah, so our very first one was Dr. Dan Upson himself. Um, Since then, we've had a couple of big names. We've had Temple Grandin came in and talked about animal welfare and autism. And then we've had names such as Senator Jerry Moran, Um, We've had Vance Crow from Monsanto, as well as we've done panel styles over beef production and antibiotics. Um, We've also had some of our very own speakers, such as Dr. Barry Flinchbog, who's an ag economics professor here at K-State. So those are just some of the ones we've done over the past years since 2009 when our first one. This next lecture is taking place on Monday, November the 6th, and it'll be at the Hilton Garden Inn here in Manhattan, the ballroom there, that evening. We'll repeat that in just a moment. Tell us about who you're bringing in. So I'm really excited for our speaker this year. It's Dr. Leon Beringer. Currently, he's the commander of the 932nd Medical Group in the Air Force. And he is coming in to talk about a unique tie between food and freedom um, because he has such a strong military background. But he also was a food animal veterinarian. He got his doctorate in veterinary science from the University of California, Davis, in 1991. And he's presenting, Why Do Agriculturists Stand for the National Anthem? He hasn't told us a lot of details about his presentation, but I know he really wanted to tie in recent current events with the agricultural industry because I know there's been lots of surrounding us with standing for the National Anthem. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited for this very intriguing title. (laughs) And it is something out of the ordinary. And his background as a veterinarian in the service Mm -hmm. brings a unique perspective to animal agriculture, to food production, and most assuredly to, in this case, patriotism then. Yeah, because he's done so much in the military. He used to be a commanding surgeon, um, and now he trains medical personnel to go out So it's just really diverse, his background. He's done a lot of different things, and he can tie a lot of different perspectives together. So I'm really excited for that. Interesting. And it ought to be a great evening indeed. To remind folks, Malia, this is a free lecture open to the public at large, right? Correct. And that will take place again Monday, November the 6th. Six o'clock is the start time for the lecture. There will be a chance to bring questions before Dr. Berenger as well, will there not? Mm -hmm. Yes, so he'll give his presentation and then we'll open it up um, to any questions that the audience has for him. Very good. It'll be quite a unique presentation, and once again it's entitled, Why Do Agriculturalists Stand During the National Anthem? Presented by Dr. Leon Berenger. Again, he's with the 932nd Medical Group with the United States Air Force and a veterinary operations consultant for a nutrition company. 
we appreciate Malia you sharing a few moments on the lecture and good luck with pulling it off and all the organization that goes into finalizing it here. So thank you for coming by. Yeah, thank you for having me. She's Malia Anderson and she chairs the Upson Lecture Series Committee this year, a junior in animal sciences and industry and agricultural economics here at K-State. The latest installment again, Monday, November the 6th, 6 o'clock, the Hilton Garden Inn Ballroom in Manhattan featuring once more Dr. Leon Berenger. Be in Manhattan for that event, if at all possible, if you can. Now, this week's edition of Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forester, Jaron Tyndall. Jaron? The most productive and diverse part of our landscape is usually right next to our streams. This is known as the riparian area, and its management has received increased attention in recent years due to the critical part it plays in water and wildlife issues. Riparian areas are transitional zones between terrestrial and aquatic systems that exhibit characteristics of both. They perform vital ecological functions while linking streams to the uplands around them. These functions include decreasing flooding, maintaining appropriate water conditions for aquatic life, providing organic material vital for productivity and structure of aquatic ecosystems, and protecting aquatic ecosystems by removing sediments from surface runoff. They also provide excellent wildlife habitat, offering not only a water source, but food and shelter as well. Riparian areas are typically vegetated with lush growths of grasses, forbs, shrubs, and trees that are tolerant of periodic flooding. Riparian systems may have one to three zones, depending on the location and habitat structure. Some systems are very simple with a single zone of grasses and sedges. Other systems have additional zones of primarily woody vegetation and mixes of upland and riparian plants. Each zone consists of vegetation adapted to survive in its specific moisture and disturbance regimes. Threats to riparian areas have come from many sources. Riparian forests and bottomlands are fertile and valued for farmland and rangeland, as well as being prime waterfront property desired by developers. Since the early 1900s, riparian areas have been cleared and converted to use as pastures, cultivated fields, and housing developments. Urban encroachment, channelization, and other water resource development activities have contributed to their destruction and alteration. Symptoms of this include erosion, declines in water quality, more frequent and expansive flooding, and colonization by invasive plants which reduce wildlife habitat. For more information on riparian areas and their management, please visit kansasforest.org. This has been Jaron Tyndall with the Kansas Forest Service, bringing you another tree tale. Thanks, Jaron. And this is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This Agriculture Today concludes with our weekly Kansas 4-H segment, and we're now a few weeks into the new 4-H project year, and there's still opportunity for 4-Hers to lock down that lineup of projects. Joining us now is Beth Hinshaw. She's the Research and Extension 4-H Specialist for K-State, based in southeast Kansas, and Beth offering a few handy guidelines on making sensible project selections here. And This is important, Beth, because you want those projects to be tailored well to the individual forager, right? Definitely. And a lot of times people may not even understand what we're talking about when we say a 4-H project. And our 4-H projects are really an opportunity for young people to learn by doing. And along the way, they also learn some life skills with that and often get to the point where they've totally mastered that project or just keep, you know, going further and further in the project. So the kinds of things that are involved when somebody enrolls in a project, they figure out what their area of interest is, they select that project, they set some goals for that project, and then they'll do some kind of hands-on activities, hopefully with that project. 
and hopefully share those skills with others. You know, we have lots of opportunities at club meetings and 4-H Day to do demonstrations and illustrated talks and project talks. And we know that that's one way that young people continue to learn is by sharing with others. Then hopefully they'll get to exhibit that project, maybe at their county fair, maybe even the state fair, or there's other places as well. And then probably participate in some kind of project events, maybe some judging contests or special contests, and then keep records of that progress. So that's everything that's involved in a 4-H project. And there is a buffet, if you will, of projects from which youngsters can select. Yeah, there really is. And that's one thing I want people to be aware of is that we have a 4-H project selection guide for Kansas, and that's going to be available on our website www.kansas4h.org, and it's under What's Hot, and it's called the Project Selection Guide. We'll remind you of that before we let Beth get away today. When a youngster, and uh, with the help of parents in many cases, are choosing projects, uh, what are some of the key things they need to actually think about? Well, you've hit on one of those early keys, and that is to make that decision with your parents and with your volunteers. And so we want youth to find something that they're interested in. So that's probably number one, is find something that they really want to know more about or have some experiences in. It's also really important that they evaluate really what kind of time do they have available for a project. You can do as little or as much as you want to do in projects, but um, you really do need to make sure you have the kind of time available to do what it is that you want to do. There's also the question of financing. You know, is that something that fits into your family's budget to take part in that project? We have projects that really cost nothing to do all the way to, you know, if you perhaps have a livestock animal or um, something like that, it might cost a lot more. So you have to know what kind of financing is available. Also, you need to know what kind of equipment and what kind of space is going to be needed. You know, if you're going to be in the rabbit project, you're going to have to have a place to keep all of those rabbits and probably some kind of housing for them. I also think that it's important to know what kind of leadership is available. Like, is there a countywide dog project club or is there a countywide horse project club or are there leaders in this club that you've enrolled in that are going to lead that project? Because if there aren't, then you're going to have to find another way to get project instruction. And I guess the sixth thing is probably to make sure that you enroll in a project that's age appropriate for you or, you know, in the right level um, for your experience level in that project. And then the last thing that I always like um, young people to think about is do certain projects work together? Um, You know, if you take the plant science project, would that also go maybe with a healthy living project because you're growing things in a garden? Or does the plant science project work with your foods and nutrition project? And maybe you're going to learn to do foods preservation or make things with what you grow. There's all kinds of projects like that, that there might be some kind of a tie and it just makes some synergy there. So some homework before making selections is important. And to that last point about uh, making project selections that are complementary of each other, if that's an, an option here, it comes back to that long-standing question, how many projects should a youngster take on in one given 4-H year? And we've seen this time and again where a 4 h year might be overly ambitious and excited about too many projects when it uh, is all said and done. Yes, I I think a common rule of thumb is to start with no more than three, especially for your first year in 4-H, so you can really understand what all is involved in a project and so that you don't get overwhelmed. And then I think as young people get older, their opportunities seem to just increase as well. And so sometimes even when young people are older, they have to kind of really think about what do I really have time to do? Because we don't want anybody to be overwhelmed and stressed. We want you to have a good experience in your projects. And that experience is enhanced the more you can spend time with it. So just make it a good balance is what that comes back to. And uh, this is the time that youngsters should be, in fact, getting these projects squared away for the next year. You would rather they not wait too late into 4-H year to do this, right, Beth? 
Definitely. You know, the new 4-H year is, has begun, just like you said when we started our interview. And the sooner you get enrolled in a project or enrolled in 4-H, um, the sooner you start learning about all the things that are available. So if you wait too late, you might miss some really exceptional project learning opportunities. So we say don't delay. Enroll today. As you said earlier, Beth, and again reiterating, the selection guide for 4-H projects is handy. It's online at the Kansas 4-H website. And when folks go to that What's Hot tab, what will they see? It is a nice brochure that lists all of the different projects that we have in Kansas 4-H and the different phases, and then also some things that you can do within that project. So it's just a handy, I think it's an eight-page guide for people, and it's going it's available in black and white or in color. Very good. www.kansas4-h.org. Look to the right-hand side of that page in the What's Hot column and look for the 4-H Project Selection Guide. This is one of those things that needs to be taken care of here very soon, 4-Hers and parents. Beth, thanks for the reminders right here. Thanks, Eric. She is Beth Hinshaw, Research and Extension 4-H Specialist. She works in southeast Kansas for the university in that capacity. And those are some important considerations on 4-H project selection as this next 4-H project year is off and running. That is this week's 4-H segment. And our time for this Monday edition. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.